The video game landscape today is multi-platform, online, connected and dissected. We've sure come a long way from the Super Mario Bros, yet retro gaming is still very much on the minds of players today. Before we begin, we publish new content all week long, so be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. Specifically, the Atari 2600 was a juggernaut of its time, a home console breakthrough that continues to be fondly remembered around the world. It created a seismic shift into how we enjoyed video games at home, yet its reign at the top was surprisingly brief. Today, we take a look at one of the great granddaddies of them all. This is Context TV. Primitive History We're referring to the Atari 2600 as one of the great granddaddies, because it actually wasn't the first home console system for video gaming. That honor goes to the Magnavox Odyssey, which was released in the United States during the autumn of 1972. The honor is a dubious one for the Odyssey, however, as the reliance upon plastic television overlays, overly complicated instructions and physical game-enhancing add-ons meant that a serious amount of imagination was required to enjoy its otherwise primitive dot-and-dash graphics scheme. Here, first it didn't necessarily mean best, and it would be a scant five years before Atari's flagship 2600 system would hit North American shelves as competition to the Odyssey. The console was originally called the Atari Video Computer System, or VCS, and didn't receive the classic 2600 moniker until November 1982. Atari Inc. were already pioneers in the video game entertainment world prior to the release of the 2600, thanks to a little phenomenon you might have heard of called Pong. Pong was the creation of programming pioneer Alan Alcorn, who created the game for Atari founders Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney. The game was a sensation almost instantly, with primitive stand-up Pong machines doing big business at local California bars, and home versions of the game filling homes and living rooms throughout North America. Before long, however, Atari would make that great leap of faith beyond Pong and into the great unknown of cartridge-based console gaming. We have Liftoff. The late 1970s saw a glut of poorly manufactured Pong knockoffs to go along with Magnavox's Odyssey, while future Atari competitors, ColecoVision and Mattel Electronics in television systems, weren't too far off on the horizon. The VCS immediately stood out at its 1977 launch, thanks not only to the variety of its cartridge-based catalog, but also the hardware which was lurking under its hard plastic hood. Microprocessors were considered cutting-edge technology for the time, and the Atari 2600 utilized these and its 128 bytes of RAM to create what was, at the time, a unique and revolutionary home entertainment experience. The VCS retailed for nearly $200 when it was released, which translates to over 800 bucks today, when taking into account inflation adjustments, of course. This sticker shock may have impacted the slow start of roughly 400,000 units sold during 1977. Still, the fact that the Apple II home computer was still retailing for over a grand at this time may have made the 2600 look a bit more appealing than all those bulky and awkward Pong sets lying around the living room floor. The ever-evolving nature of technology meant that it became more difficult for programmers to stretch the limitations of the VCS as the games became more involved and complex. At the same time, many in the field also saw these limitations as a challenge to be as creative, pushing boundaries while, in the process, laying down important groundwork for an entire industry which would be spawned in their wake. Golden Age Success and Expansion the Atari 2600 wasn't only a fertile ground for video game developers, it also helped change how video game design was viewed and how it needed to change as gaming became more and more socially acceptable. It's important to note that the acceptance of console gaming into the home helped in softening the reputation of video games as a whole. At this time, gaming was still largely found in the arcade scene, which had sprouted up in cities and towns around the world. Social gaming was still viewed by some as a seedy element best left to bars and dirty arcades, 
where drug use and other illegal activities were assumed to be the norm. The acceptance of Atari into North American homes helped make gaming a family venture. But behind the scenes, there was growing unrest regarding developers earning credit for all of their work. This desire for recognition was what, in part, helped spear the formation of Activision, the first third-party game developer. The company was founded in 1979 by four of Atari's most talented game designers, who were tired of the lack of monetary incentive and creative respect offered by the company's CEO, Ray Kassar who succeeded Nolan Bushnell after the latter sold Atari to Warner Communications. Activision would develop the classic pitfall for the 2600, along with other heavy hitters like Kaboom, River Raid, and Crackpots. By 1979, the 2600 was a certified phenomenon, selling over 1 million units just over the course of that year's Christmas season. Atari expanded its cartridge library by this point with licensing deals in addition to their third-party titles. One of the most successful and iconic of these licensed games was Space Invaders, which drummed up even more console sales for the VCS to the tune of over 10,000 million 2600s sold by 1982. By this time, Atari was already looking forward to a new console, the Atari 5200. And it was at this time where the VCS, a stone-cold killer, was officially branded as the Atari 2600. Crash and burn. All was not well, however, and there was a dark cloud on the horizon for Atari, as well as its competitors. It's now known as the North American Video Game Crash of 1983, and it would shake these companies to their very core. There were a lot of reasons behind exactly why this crash occurred, and today, thanks to hindsight, we can see where the writing was on the wall, and why it led to such a bust-up for Atari, Mattel, Magnavox, and more. Right off the bat, the glut of companies getting into the video game business with subpar consoles flooded the market, with the likes of Bally, Bandai, and more getting into the mix. Then, there were the games. At this point, the debacle behind Atari's E.T., the extraterrestrial, is the stuff of video game legend. The game was given less than six weeks to be developed, packaged, manufactured, and delivered for the Christmas sale season of 1982. This effectively doomed E.T. from the start, meaning that not even veteran game designer Howard Scott Warshall, who had previously helmed hits like Yars, Revenge, and Raiders of the Lost Ark, had a chance to give the project the attention it deserved, but met with a high amount of returns, not to mention a negative reaction from critics. Today, it enjoys something of a cult reputation as, debatably, one of the worst video games ever made, while also serving as one of the most important. Its crash and burn failure added to the 2600's mystique, as well as Atari's, with the story of millions of unsold ET cartridges being buried in landfill continuing to fascinate gamers to this day. A similar situation befell Atari with its 2600 port of Pac-Man, which suffered from poor development, yet still sold well, despite its visual limitations. Furthermore, the company was quickly losing control of its third-party licensees, who filled the market with even worse games. At one point, it was easy for even the most random of companies, such as Ralston Purina, to develop a terrible game for the Atari 2600 and basically give it away with their product as some sort of cross-promotional tool. There were even headline-earning horror and pornographic titles made for the 2600 by companies such as Mystique, Wizard Video Games, and Swedish Erotica. These titles, which included adaptations of Halloween and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, were often sold under the counter and were meant for adults. But their infamy led to further attention being placed upon Atari's lack of control in both quality and quantity. The 2600, a legacy and brand. Of course, we now know that the North American video game crash didn't really kill off Atari or the 2600. Sure, the implosion meant that much of the company's competition decided to back away from the video game business, but Atari continued to work. The company had already developed new consoles, such as the 5200 and 7800 Pro System by the mid-1980s, 
and even redesigned the iconic 2600 with a brand new price point of under $50 in 1986. This meant that more and more families were bringing Atari into their homes, and would continue to do so long after the system was officially discontinued in 1992. Its legacy has never really stopped either, as evidenced by the boom in retro gaming which we continue to see today. Parents take their kids to flea markets and yard sales to try and score a nice replica of the same 2600 console they owned as kids. Barcades combine vintage stand-up gaming with food and craft beer to a new generation, while YouTubers stream online long plays of challenging 2600 classics like Sword Quest, Pitfall, and yes, even E.T. And while names like Nintendo, Sega, and PlayStation would soon overtake Atari at the top of the gaming mountain, those early gaming memories never strayed too far from our consciousness. The legacy of Atari's importance to the medium and the reign of the 2600 continues to be mentioned in books, television, and documentary films today. We still remember the past, and we realize that today's amazing video game universe would be incomplete without the forward-thinking strides of Atari and the 2600 video game computer system. Check out these other great clips from Context TV, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.